Committee on Homeland Security, Subcommittee on Border and Maritime Security will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to examine Commissioner McAleenan's vision for the future of Customs and Border Protection. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. I'd like to start by welcoming the newly confirmed U.S. Customs and Border Protection Commissioner, Kevin McAleenan, to testify before our committee today and congratulate him on your, on your Senate confirmation last month. The Commissioner and CBP have been and will continue to be the focal point for many of the Trump administration's border security priorities. The nation is fortunate that the Commissioner is a seasoned veteran, a consummate professional who knows the agency and its issues well, having been with CBP since the early days of its creation. CBP is a massive law enforcement agency created from the fusion of several legacy agencies established in 2003. In fact, today is the largest, uh, it's the largest law enforcement organization in the federal government. Uh, but up until 2015, it was not even authorized in statute, a situation that was finally addressed by the work of the subcommittee. And the 19 codified duties of the commissioner are some of the most important responsibilities that Congress has given to any single official. Securing the border, facilitating legitimate travel and commerce, and administering important national security programs that prevent bad actors from gaining access to the country. And with any organization this large, there are significant challenges. Staffing shortages at both the ports of entry and in the Border Patrol, exacerbated by, both by a hiring process that takes far too long and retention challenges that have persisted for years with no signs of abatement. CBP is critically understaffed and remains well below its congressionally mandated staffing levels by more than 1,000 CBP officers and 1,900 Border Patrol agents. Combined with the growing crisis along the southwest border, there, this shortage has the potential to put our nation's national security at risk. The number of illegal border crossings during this month of March show an urgent need to address the ongoing situation. We witnessed a 203% increase from March 2017 to March 2018, and a 37% increase from last month to this month, the largest increase from month to month since 2011. Before 2013, approximately one out of every arriving aliens claimed credi credible fear or asylum. Today, more than one out of 10 do. Saying the words, quote, credible fear, end quote, just as many aliens are coached by the drug cartels and mules to do, often permits them to be released into the country, regardless of the merit of such claims, to await for a court date years in the future that many do not even show up for. We also continue to see our system plagued by increased levels of fraud among individuals crossing the border, which then makes it more difficult to help those who need it the most. In the past, over 90% of arriving aliens were single adult males. Today, 40% are families and children. The traffickers and smugglers know that if you arrive with a family, you've got a better chance of being released into the U.S. with most families only able to be detained for less than 20 days due to court rulings. We have seen smuggling organizations advertise this as an enticement, and we have seen traffickers use children as leverage to gain entry into the country. Since beginning, the beginning of this fiscal year, almost 22,000 unaccompanied minors and 40,000 families arrived at the border under these policies that enrich the cartels. In other words, because of the insanity of the loopholes in our current law, the next generation of DACA-like people are crossing the border and disappearing into the community. We are a nation of immigrants, and we, are wel we welcome about a million legal immigrants into our country each year, but we are being taken advantage of, and it needs to stop. In addition to the border wall, we also need a policy wall as well, which is why I have been calling for these border security loopholes to be closed. We must change our immigration policy to enable the agencies charged with protecting our border to do their job and quickly remove dangerous public safety risks from our communities. Thankfully, in response to these troubling border security trends, the President has called for the deployment of thousands of National Guard troops to support the effort of the men and women of CBP. National Guard personnel have supported border security operations several times in recent years. They've built fences and roads, conducted ground surveillance along the border, flown aviation support missions, monitored camera feeds, and provided intelligence support. They're truly a force multiplier that can provide unique skills to boost our border security. I'd like to thank Arizona Governor uh, Doug Ducey and other governors along the border who have answered the call to partner with the federal government to deploy these border security reinforcements and support the CBP mission. The additional men and women deployed on our border will reduce threats posed by violent drug cartels and other bad actors that threaten border communities and the nation as a whole. In addition to the deployment of the Guard, Congress has also recently provided CBP with billions of dollars to invest in technology, wall replacement, and new wall construction that will serve as a powerful deterrent to illegal entry. We look forward to hearing an update on the status of wall construction and a concrete, no pun intended, timeline for its completion. 
<clears throat> I call this hearing today to allow the commissioner an opportunity to present to our subcommittee, which has principal oversight responsibility of the agency, what his vision is for CVP. I look forward to his testimony, followed by a thoughtful discussion. The chair now recognizes the me ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vela, for a statement he may have. Thank you, Chairwoman McSally, for holding today's hearing, and thank you, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, for your leadership uh, on the S Homeland Security Committee as well. Uh, Commissioner McAleen, and th congratulations on your recent confirmation, and thank you for joining us today. I know you have been at CBP for more than a decade now, and that you are very familiar with the Office of Field Operations side of CBP. My office and I receive daily notifications and press releases from CBP about the volume and value of the nar narcotics that are seized coming through our ports of entry. For example, CBP officers at the far port of entry seized 45 pounds of cocaine valued at more than $347,000 earlier this month. At the Progreso International Bridge, CBP officers seized nearly 20 pounds of crystal meth valued at more than $381,000 in early April as well. CBP publishes its enforcement statistics monthly, and I have noted that over the past several years, more drugs are seized on average by the Office of Field Operations than Border Patrol. The only exception to that is marijuana, which Border Patrol interdicts at a much higher rate. In addition to keeping people and contraband from entering illegally, CBP is also responsible for facilitating legitimate trade and travel, both of which are major drivers for economic growth. This means CBP officers inspect $6.5 billion worth of cargo on a daily basis. CBP officers are also responsible for screening and vetting foreign and U.S. citizen travelers headed to the United States and at our international airports, cruise terminals, or land ports of entry. The fact that CBP continues to rely on temporary duty assignments and back-to-back -back shifts to make up for its officer shortage remains a major concern. I have stated on multiple occasions that CBP's officer staffing shortage and difficulty in retaining professional Border Patrol agents are self-inflicted vulnerabilities. These CBP staffing issues are critical to border security yet the administration continues to avoid these problems. Commissioner, I introduced the Border and Port Security Act to give you the ability to hire more officers and agriculture specialists, but we need your commitment to address the internal problems that are making it difficult to uh, keep new personnel on board. I am glad that my bill has bipartisan support, and I know that Chairwoman McSally has her own proposal to address CBP's officer staffing shortage. My hope is that we can work on this issue in a bipartisan way, much like we did with the Public-Private Partnership Authority granted to CBP to address infrastructure need at our ports of entry. The City of Donna and CBP have been working to establish the model port concept or the new way to streamline cargo and passenger vehicle inspections through the, don through the donation acceptance program. This project is an example of the many ways investments in our port infrastructure affects positive change along the border. I hope that your confirmation gives you a greater ability to ensure that the administration uses the facts when considering changes to border security. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I ask for unanimous consent to enter statements from NTEU and the Electronic Information Privacy Center into the record. Without objection. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall. Thank you, Chairwoman McSally and, and Ranking Member Vela uh, for having this hearing. First, I'd like to congratulate you, sir, Commissioner McAleenan, on your Senate confirmation uh, last month. Uh, well done. I'm glad the Senate finally got that uh, accomplished. They have a lot more to do, in my judgment, but that's another uh, point of view. Our country, uh, though, is fortunate, I think, that you are willing to answer the President's call and serve as Commissioner of this very vital, important agency. Uh, CBP has a broad and important mission from securing our border to facilitating legitimate trade to ensuring those who enter our country do so legally. Uh, Commissioner, you have a lot on your plate. I'm confident, though, that you're up to the task. Uh, despite this historic drop that we saw in apprehensions last year, uh, more must be done to secure the border. Uh, as you know and know very well, during the last few months, we observed a troubling spike in illegal immigration over 200%. Uh, more crossings this year than last. Many who are apprehended at the border are not looking to even evade capture, uh, but rather they simply turn themselves in uh, to the nearest Border Patrol agent or CBP officer and claim a fear of persecution and fear of a, uh, an asylum claim uh, 
the persecution in their country. Uh, that is what the drug cartels have coached them to say, uh, and that's what they do. And unfortunately, the cartels understand the weakness of our immigration laws all too well. They have marketed the use of immigration loopholes to entice illicit migrants. I support Secretary Nielsen's call to close these legal loopholes. We need to change the law that treats unaccompanied minors from Mexico and Central America differently. We must also reform our asylum policies and ensure the prompt removal of anyone who crosses the border illegally, regardless of where they come from. Uh, in response to the recent surge, mainly in South Texas, the President deployed thousands of National Guard troops to support the efforts of men and women of CBP. I applaud this effort, uh, but sending the National Guard to the border is nothing really new. Uh, Guard troops helped build the fence in Operation Jumpstart uh, under President Bush and provided much needed aviation support uh, to supplement uh, CBP's Air and Marine operations under Operation Felix uh, during the Obama administration. I also want to thank my governor, Governor Abbott, for his leadership on border security. Uh, my home state of Texas, I believe, has been leading the way when it comes to uh, securing the border. And for years, we've used the National Guard on our border at our state's expense uh, to help ensure the safety of Texans, despite years of inaction by previous administrations. Congress has recently provided CBP with billions of dollars to invest in technology, barrier replacement, new levee wall construction, and the Rio Grande Valley sector. Uh, I believe all this is desperately needed uh, down there. I believe this will serve as a powerful deterrent to illegal entry as well as provide flood protection against the Rio Grande uh, Valley uh, from the river. So this is a very important issue and I look forward to an update on how CBP um, prepares to, um, as this caravan they call it, uh, prepares to come up north uh, into the United States and other threats as well. And Madam Chair, with that, I yield back. And Chairman Neal's back. Chair, now recognize the ranking member from the full committee, a gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Max Alley and Ranking Member Vela, uh, for holding today's hearing. Commissioner, good seeing you again. Uh, it's always nice to have the permanent title uh, after uh, your nomination. Uh, you are officially and have been head of CBP for only a month, but your many years in leadership positions within CBP will no doubt serve you well in this new position. I encourage you to use your deep knowledge of CBP to meaningfully inform the department's approach to border security. Uh, our border security challenges are more nuanced than simply building a wall. At a time when the department's own data show that illegal entries are at the lowest level they have been since the 1970s, it makes little sense as to why we should heavily rely on building walls for the foreseeable future or deploy National Guard's troops to the southern border. During last month's subcommittee, the Government Accountability testified that U.S. Customs and Border Protection still does not have the metrics to measure how a wall contributes to border security in general. I urge you to correct this immediately. Given the CBP has received more than $1 billion for barriers and requested another $1 billion for upcoming fiscal year, I'm concerned that we are bound to repeat many mistakes if we do not know what we are getting in return. I'm also echoing Representative Rankin Member Vela's uh, frustration that the Trump administration continues to overlook critical staffing problems within CBP and particularly the shortage of officers manning our ports of entry. Both Border Patrol and the Office of Field Operations are losing trained, experienced agents and officers at a faster rate than CBP is able to replace them. This is another problem that I urge you to address quickly. Additionally, I'm concerned by the policy proposals and practice CBP and other components within DHS are using to deter illegal immigration. In February, all 12 of the Democrats on this committee and 63 other Democratic colleagues sent a letter to Secretary Nielsen asking her to halt the practice of separating migrant parents from their children when they are apprehended at the border or in immigration detention in cases that do not warrant it. The practice is inhumane, excessively punitive, and can deliberately interfere with their legal right 
to request asylum. I reiterate my opposition to this practice, and I caution CBP from pursuing other such practices that do not honor our values as a nation of immigrants. In your testimony, you commit to enhancing internal integrity programs, transparency, and professionalism measures. I take you uh, and take this to mean that misconduct and lack of professionalism by errant agents and officers will be swiftly addressed. A number of videos have circulated in recent months that show CB personnel acting in ways that do not seem to comply with this policy. Uh, we know that the overwhelming majority of CBP personnel work hard, conduct themselves professionally, and are a credit to their agency. I hope you are investigating these incidents to ensure that they are not indicative of a problem within CBP's ranks. Lastly, Mr. Commissioner, I hope you are able to share with us how your priorities for CBP align with the administration's. As we've seen on multiple occasions, experts at CBP and DHS are neither informing nor even being notified in advance of major policy changes to border security operation. To roll out uh, of the first travel ban executive order last year and the recent National Guard deployment announcement come to mind as examples. I hope your confirmation gives you a greater ability to ensure the administration uses the facts when considering changes to border security and that your firsthand knowledge that more than walls are required is well utilized. I thank you for agreeing to testify before us today and look forward to your testimony and yield back. Tony yields back. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We're pleased to have Commissioner Kevin McAleenan before us today to discuss a wide, wide range of issues facing CBP. Commissioner McAleenan was sworn in on March 20th, 2018 as the fifth commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Prior to his confirmation, Mr. McAleenan served as the acting commissioner since the beginning of this administration. As the agency's chief executive, Mr. McAleenan oversees 60,000 employees, manages a budget of over $13 billion, and ensures the effective operations of CBP's mission to protect national security while promoting economic prosperity. The witness's full written statement will appear in the record. The chair now recognizes Commissioner McAleenan for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman McSally, Ranking Member Vela. Uh, it was nice to see the full committee chairman McCall as well as ranking member Thompson here and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It's a privilege to speak to you about my priorities as commissioner and to represent the nearly 60,000 strong men and women of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The opportunity to lead and work alongside these men and women is the biggest privilege of my professional life. CBP is central to many priorities for the American people and the administration from countering terrorism, to enhancing border security, to securing and facilitating trade and travel. Our dedicated officers and agents, specialists, pilots, and support personnel are relentlessly pursuing a more secure and economically competitive nation. My vision for CBP is that we aspire to become the most effective, most innovative, and most trusted and transparent law enforcement agency in the United States while remaining the premier border security and management agency in the world. During my tenure as CBP Commissioner, I'm committed to five overarching priorities. Attracting, retaining, and developing the most qualified and resilient workforce to serve our nation and meet tomorrow's challenges. Accelerating the adoption of innovative technologies to keep America and our people safe. Building and strengthening partnerships across government and with international counterparts transforming the ways that our stakeholders interact with CBP and our operations, and investing in our culture through unity of effort initiatives that further develop a common purpose and a mission commitment across all CBP's operational and support components. My written testimony submitted to the committee further elaborates CBP's ongoing efforts to enhance our security and strengthen our organization, keep our nation safe, and my priority strategies for continuing to improve. With the support of Congress to provide us the resources, authorities, and legislative changes we need, I believe that CBP will continue to make great strides across our core missions and in every area of our operations. 
We will also enhance our internal integrity programs and pursue transparency and professionalism measures that will help us increase and maintain the trust of the public we are sworn to serve. But even as we continue to enhance border security at and between ports of entry, increasing our effectiveness at identifying and interdicting threats, apprehensions of those crossing our border illegally or who are determined to be inadmissible at ports of entry continue to rise. Seizures of illicit hard narcotics are also increasing across all categories, both at and between ports of entry, especially methamphetamine and synthetic opioids like fentanyl. And as we strengthen our screening and vetting across multiple agencies to identify potential threats before they enter the United States, we continue to face a multifaceted and dispersed terrorist adversary. We need to continue to invest in and deploy critical capabilities to prevent and interdict illegal crossings between ports of entry. A modern border wall system, situational awareness sensors, airborne, mobile, and fixed, access and mobility, and mission readiness. Our Border Patrol agents, pilots, and Air and Marine interdiction agents and support personnel. At our ports of entry, we need enhanced non-intrusive inspection equipment to detect deep concealments of drugs and CBP officers and agriculture specialists. For our trade enforcement mission, we will augment our dedicated and expert team with additional specialists, auditors, and attorneys. And we need to continue to build on our world-leading capabilities at the National Targeting Center and develop the new National Vetting Center as well as supporting increased capacity for our international partners. But CBP is ultimately only one part of a much larger system, one that neither begins or ends at our borders. To address threats of illegal immigration and human smuggling, narcotics trafficking and terrorism, we need to close legal loopholes in our immigration enforcement system, expand our investigative and interdiction reach, and strengthen international partnerships and policy alignment. Illegal and irregular immigration will continue at increasing levels unless the systemic vulnerabilities in our statutory regime are addressed. If only a small percentage of those border crossers apprehended by the Border Patrol in certain categories are effectively repatriated, others, drawn by a strong economy, the prospect of family reunification, and the promise of a successful crossing will continue to follow. These loopholes create a powerful magnet, draining energy and youth from Central America, even as we work to invest and partner in the security and prosperity of that neighboring region. They put children at risk of violence and assault, they enrich transnational criminal organizations, and they threaten the security of our international neighborhoods, international neighbors and our domestic neighborhoods. The administration's legislative priorities on unaccompanied children and family units, asylum and credible fear, along with the requested investments in Central America and elsewhere, would help address these issues. I urge Congress to act on these priorities, and I look forward to working with members on both sides of the aisle to address these challenges. Border security is national security. It's a nonpartisan issue. With the ongoing support of Congress, CBP will continue to secure our nation's borders while facilitating international trade and travel. Our dedicated frontline workforce and our supporting team will ensure it. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, we have been working on closing these legal, legal loopholes for a while, and I want to recognize that my bill, along with Chairman McCall and Good Latin Labrador, we address these issues. Uh, but for you know, the, the public out there, the laymen, our constituents, maybe they don't understand what we're talking about, right? We're talking about how even if you have the will and the desire uh, in order to secure the border and with your CBP personnel and your Border Patrol agents, if you catch someone, you're able to swiftly be able to send them back and then that deters others from coming and then it also uh, stops the profits of the cartels, that these loopholes do not allow that to happen. And we've referenced it today, but can you paint it in layman's terms what the issue is and how it's being exploited by these cartels. This caravan has gotten a lot of attention uh, where there's a large group of people coming here. Many of them will also exploit these loopholes, but it's happening every single day in the communities along the border. So can you can give you an opportunity to just talk through those and why it's so important that we in Congress close these loopholes so that you can do your job? Sure. I, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. I'd be happy to talk through uh, the loopholes. Uh, what what we're facing at the border and our, our sector chief in Rio Grande Valley, which is seeing about 50% of our, our apprehensions nationally, uh, has, has invented a new term uh, to address the increasing traffic. And you highlighted some of it in your opening statement, uh, as opposed to 90% adults uh, in, a, in a 
migrant workforce that we saw in the past, we're now seeing 40 percent kids and families crossing the border. He, he's taken the calling in these populations uh, non-impactables, meaning that there is no uh, consequence, there is no uh, response uh, to an illegal entry uh, for these groups. Uh, for unaccompanied children, uh, I think you, you need only look at the disparity between Mexican nationals and, and uh, children from Central America and further away. Uh, about 96 percent of Mexican unaccompanied children are returned uh, within three years. Uh, that number drops to 3 percent for people from other countries. Mm. Uh, essentially, once a Border Patrol agent apprehends them, and usually they're, they're actually looking for a Border right. Patrol agent uh, once they cross the border, uh, they're taken into custody, processed, and quickly uh, turned over uh, via our partners at Immigration and Customs Enforcement to Health and Human Services, where they can be properly cared for. Uh, they are then uh, had their, have their sponsor vetted, and they're, they're turned over by Health and Human Services to someone uh, living in the United States, uh, po possibly illegally. Uh, so that, that's the process for an unaccompanied child. Uh, for a member of a family unit, uh, if they're apprehended, and again, they're not always seeking to evade Border Patrol agents, sometimes uh, they're picked up uh, relatively routinely right at the borderline, uh, they're turned over to ICE. Uh, ICE uh, takes them to a family residential facility uh, where they're processed and detained generally for less than 20 days. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the expected standard due to court uh, decisions uh, in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, they're then released pending a court hearing, which could happen many years out. And in, in the meantime, they're, they're living here with authorization to be uh, employed. Uh, this is a real challenge because that first threshold of, of determining whether somebody might have a fear of returning to their country is very low. Uh, so a very high percentage gets that. Uh, but the ultimate court decision doesn't come for many years. Uh, so it creates a, a significant pull factor for others. And then the third category is adults that claim fear uh, that also go through that asylum process uh, and, and spend time here in between that initial determination of fear and that ultimate court decision, which could be many years out due to the significant backlog in our immigration courts. So for a Border Patrol agent on the border, they, they want to protect the American people from threats. Uh, they don't want to interdict and, and process people that are, are coming to claim asylum between ports of entry. It's, it's, not a, it's not a good process. The status quo is not acceptable. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, uh, expanding on that. I mean, I th the, the thing that's, that's uh, it's the insanity is that essentially the message is to any transnational criminal organization or really anybody, just get yourself, get your kid, just get to the border, look for someone, turn yourself in, say the right words, and then you can disappear into the interior of the United States with a very small percentage showing up for their court date in the future, correct? That, that is correct, and, and that's exactly right. The transnational criminal organizations are, are preying on these individuals. They're charging them five to $10,000 to smuggle them to the border and allow them to use their area of the border to cross. Uh, that enriches organizations that are threatening the security and safety of, of Mexican citizens, uh, and, it, and it puts those children at risk of assault and violence in the process. Thank you. And so can you talk about the caravan then? And then I'll, I'll yield back and uh, we'll, we'll do another round. But can you talk about the caravan and how this is impacting? We, we're, everyone's sort of watching this all happen with this big caravan, but this is happening every day in smaller numbers. I, I think the caravan highlights the, the challenge uh, that the loopholes present. Uh, if we don't have alignment and migration policy between countries, uh, destination and transit countries, if we don't have uh, a statutory regime that has loopholes closed, uh, this invites uh, groups like this to try to come to our border uh, and come into the United States in this irregular fashion. Uh, so we're going to enforce the immigration law. We're going to absolutely treat uh, uh, claims of fear and protection fairly uh, as we encounter this group. Uh, but it, it presents a challenge and, and just, I think, is highlighting publicly uh, the issues that we're facing in the statutory regime. Thank you. All right, I yield back. Turn, I'll recognize Mr. Vela. Thank you, Chairman McSally. Uh, after we passed, after the House passed the spending bill, uh, the House Democratic leader issued this statement. Uh, Democrats want explicit language restricting border construction to the same see-through fencing that was already authorized under current law. Uh, and what I'm wondering if that's true or not, because uh, when we take a look at the provision for $445 million in primary pedestrian levy fencing, that comes out to $17 million a mile. And can, can you elaborate on that? Because $17 million a mile uh, doesn't sound like it's just see-through fencing. So I think we're maybe covering a couple different topics uh, together. 
Uh, the, the 17 uh, appropriated funding is for a replacement wall in El Paso sector, in El Centro sector, in San Diego. Yeah, 2017. I'm talking 2018. 2018, yeah. there's specific appropriations for Rio Grande Valley levee wall in right. Hidalgo County. Uh, that's a similar wall to what we built in 2008. Uh, and that is actually not see-through because it's a, right. it's a concrete wall that helps protect the levee. It's a hydraulic uh, a wall. Uh, and that's that's consistent with the appropriations uh, language, and it's it's something that we're working on, uh, planning and, and designing right now to build. Yeah, and, and that's that was precisely my question because this statement seemed uh, to be untrue because uh, that that money is for concrete levee wall, right? Yes, the the language restricted to previous uh, in similar designs to previous efforts, and and that concrete wall is very similar. Now. Um, in, in uh, anticipation of our hearing today, I had some constituents actually email because you know, representing the Rio Grande Valley sector, you can imagine uh, there are people watching uh, what we do. But I had one, uh, one question from a constituent. Uh, in its end of year report, CBP reported a 45% increase in assaults over fiscal year 2016, or 847 assaults in fiscal year 2017. Assaults against law enforcement personnel were led by U.S. Border Patrol accounting for 93% of overall assaults and OF4 reporting 6% of total assault, assaults. I understand that the method for counting and tracking assaults on CBP personnel changed a few years ago. Can you describe how these types of incidents are counted and, and uh, if, if the methodology, methodology changed or not? Sure. Uh, first, I'm, I'm very proud of the men and women who secure our border and face dangers every day on behalf of the American people. Uh, and they are uh, often subject uh, to assault and violence and carrying out their duties. We're talking about violent transnational criminal organizations uh, that are often heavily armed, uh, that are prepared for encounters with law enforcement, and, and I'm very proud of how they conduct themselves. Uh, one of the areas where we've taken uh, steps to increase our transparency is publishing a lot of data on our, our enforcement encounters, both in terms of our use of force by our agents and officers, but also on the force that they face as they're patrolling the border. Uh, so for, for our agents, we, we publish two different sets of data uh, simultaneously, the number of incidents of assault and the number of assaults, which in, could include uh, the number of people mounting an assault, the number of agents that are impacted, uh, or the, the weapons that are used in an assault. Uh, so uh, those two numbers are both transparently reported. Uh, we did see an, a spike and increase last year in the assaults. I think that a testament to the intensity uh, of those incidents, uh, and if we think it's appropriate to report both numbers to inform the public what our, our officers and agents are facing. I know you and I aren't going to meet afterwards, so I'll go into some of this other stuff later. Let me ask you about this. Um, with respect to infrastructure, can you tell us how much funding is needed uh, to fully modernize land ports of entry, and is the donation authority program sufficient uh, to make up this funding shortage? So yeah, that's a great uh, question, uh, Congressman. Our land ports of entry are, are critical uh, to the economy of the United States, to the legitimate flow of trade and travel. Uh, and you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a deficit in investment in ports of entry that, that is decades long uh, that, that we need to continue to work with Congress to fund. Uh, CBP has developed a prioritized list in partnership with GSA, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Commerce, uh, and our cross-border international partners where we need port of entry investment. Uh, and in each year, we, we work to fit as much of that as we can in concert with GSA within uh, the annual budget caps. Uh, but really, we have about a $4 billion deficit in ports of entry. And so the donation acceptance program, which allows us to work with private sector entities, with uh, cities and, and state and local governments, like you referenced in South Texas, uh, meets some of that need and provides flexibility where there's a return on investment, but we're going to continue to need uh, appropriated support uh, for those gateways of international commerce that support all 50 states. Well, thank you. Chairman Neal's back. Chair, I recognize Mr. Rogers from Alabama. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, it was obvious from your uh, first remarks in your opening statement that you recognize that the most valuable component of your border security system are people, and, uh, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But Aside from that, when you look at uh, border infrastructure, what do you think is the most critical component that you have to have to secure that border? 
the southwest border. For, for security? Uh, so it's not coming from me. It's coming from our agents and our chiefs on the ground who, who through a process every year called the Capabilities Gap Analysis uh, that's then analyzed by our headquarters operations team tell us what they need to secure that border. And they've consistently identified four master capabilities. The first is impedance and denial. Uh, that's the ability to stop someone from easily crossing and disappearing, we call it vanishing time, uh, into the United States, into infrastructure on the U.S. side. Uh, the second is situational awareness, being able to see what's happening on that border uh, through technology. And, and third uh, is, is access and mobility, the ability to reach that border and move laterally along it uh, so that they can affect interdictions. And last is mission readiness. That's our people and the communications equipment they carry with them to get to those spots. The, the number one uh, ability to impede is a wall or barrier, correct? Border, border barrier is a proven technique. We've got 654 miles of it. It's been effective at where we've applied it, uh, reducing crossings 90% and more in key areas of San Diego, Yuma, El Paso, Nogales. It, it's, it's a critical capability. You just talked with the ranking member about uh, the funds that you've had uh, to work with. Do you have enough to be able to meet that challenge on that first component of uh, border security? So the, first of all, we, we appreciate the president's request, listening to agents on the ground and what they need to secure the border between ports of entry. And, and this is a significant investment in 17 and 18 in border wall, almost $2 billion combined. Uh, that will help us get started. Uh, it's certainly a significant replacement wall. And, and the RGV wall that, that Congressman Vail alluded to, both a levee wall, uh, which we're working on 25 miles of levee wall in Hidalgo County, as well as eight miles now in Star County, are important investments in our highest traffic sector uh, that we're working hard to get uh, to get built. Well, it was obvious from your outline of your priorities that, that border security is a system. It's not any one thing. And one of the things that you've listed, I think was your number three item, was technology. Um, when it comes to procuring technology, can you uh, describe for us your process uh, for what you decide you need next and, and how you pursue that? Sure, and actually we've, we've had a lot of innovation in that side uh, of our process lately uh, by working with DHS Science and Technology to try to access more innovative technologies that are being developed by startups and provide a much faster cycle from identifying a capability that we could use in the hands of our agents and officers and then uh, contracting with the startup to start piloting it and ultimately apply it. Uh, we're doing that in multiple areas, a situational awareness system for our Border Patrol agents where they can have right there on a smartphone uh, the picture from all the sensors in their area. They can know where their fellow agents are. Uh, for our, our trade professionals that are working on identifying threats, uh, intellectual property rights or, or supply chain elements that are, are by forced labor, where we have a contract on big data to help us analyze all the trade information flowing at us. For our, for our canine teams that are working in 120 degree heat, say in Calexico, California, we're looking at wearable technology to keep them safe uh, and really trying to keep at that cutting edge. So it's really two things. It's the, it's the long-term planning on, on things like our integrated fixed towers where we have uh, an ongoing year-over-year -year contract with, with uh, capable major systems integrators, but also trying to access that emerging technology and apply it more quickly and get it in the hands of our agents. They well, don't want to show up at work and put their smartphone on the dashboard. They want to be able to take that with them and apply its capabilities as they patrol. Well, speaking of that, uh, you, in March, the acting Deputy Commissioner Batella uh, told the subcommittee that uh, fiber optic detection was something they wanted to incorporate. Is that something you still plan to do uh, into your security system? Absolutely. That, that's a core component of what we're calling a border wall system, and I, I didn't answer that part of Congressman Zvela's question fully. Uh, the, the difference in cost of what we're proposing now from what we built in 2006 or 2008 is that instead of just building a physical structure, we're integrating the entire system, the sensors, the lighting, the cameras, and the access and patrol roads that we need to make it effective. So it's a, it's a total cost, and for the property acquisition, it's a total cost, not just a one piece of it. Well, I hope you have success, but they've been trying to do that for the 16 years I've been here, and it's, uh, it's never been a, a challenge that was met. And lastly, I hope you have success on trying to deal with your uh, retention problems. Uh, it's hard to keep those folks on that border when they can make so much more money in a, in a big urban area, uh, and it's such a difficult environment to work in. But I hope you're successful. And with that, I'm sorry. My time's expired. I yield back. It's back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Correa from California for five minutes. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairperson McSally and, of course, Chairman McCall for your time and 
Ranking Member Thompson and Ranking Member Vela, and of course Commissioner McElean here for being here today. <clears throat> I come from the state of California. Today we're probably the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, and we're probably looking at becoming the number four economy in the world as soon as we pass up Great Britain. Um, unemployment right now in my county is less than 3%. Uh, big ag industry in my state. Uh, my farmers keep talking about the need for more workers. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, our immigration laws are broken in this country. Um, maybe not. But one thing we can all agree on is uh, the issue of drug addiction, opioids, heroin, and the challenges it presents to our country. It's my understanding that uh, addiction deaths of about 500% in this country right now, all over the country. So the issue of illegal drugs is a major one for all of us, and I think all of us can agree on that. Um, as we talk about those precious taxpayer dollars that we have in this country, um, I wish we would have a matrix to measure what is effective and what is not in terms of, as we call it, uh, uh, addressing the border. Um, you know, 30 years ago, the major port of entry for a lot of our drugs uh, was Miami. And as we tightened down in Miami, the shift in drugs went from the seas to inland going through Mexico. Results were Mexico was effectively destabilized because of all the drugs running through Mexico, as well as the money, as well as the arms. Uh, as we began to squeeze in that area, we will probably find Canada to be a major port of entry. Just where are you sitting, uh, Mr. Commissioner? A few months ago, we have the Commandant of the Coast Guard speaking. His testimony, 2016, 580 ships that he knew were carrying drugs could not be stopped because they didn't have the, they didn't have the assets in the Coast Guard to interject those ships as they were coming in from Latin America. 580 ships with drugs could not be stopped that we knew were heading to our shores. So as we're looking at the effectiveness of a wall, in your words, it's an effective proven tool. How does that compare to, for example, additional border agents at our ports of entry? I've gone to San Isidro, California, the biggest entry, the biggest port, the biggest crossed border port in the world. Now I've talked to those agents, and what they've told me is, Give us more dogs, give us more x-ray machines, give us more trained personnel, we can do a better job. And as I talk to those agents, you can see them smiling from one end of their face to the other. When I ask them about, tell me, how is it that you were able to spot that big shipment of drugs coming through? It wasn't about a wall. It was about trained agents being able to spot something irregular in that vehicle coming across the border. So as we look at the American taxpayer and is look at, looking at how much we need to spend and we need to spend more on interjecting drugs, where would you say our priority is in terms of investment? On a wall, X-ray machines, trained personnel, trained dogs, and I know you're going to say all of it is good, but if you had a buck, what would you spend it on first? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. You, you predicted accurately <laughs> that I was going to tell you it, it's a balanced package of all of that. Sir, I know it's balanced, but I had to prioritize where would you place your money first? Well, Congress is helping prioritize by investing in our personnel. Uh, Sir, how would you prioritize that investment? I, I would prioritize it in an even uh, posture because we so can't you say all of the above, area, not the other. Dogs, trained agents, x-ray machines, a wall, they're all Correct. equally effective at the border in stopping drugs? The, the FY18 budget, which we appreciate greatly, has a nice balanced investment in all of those things. But sir, in your opinion as a professional, inspection. where do you think those dollars are most effectively invested? I know what those border agents told me in San Isidro. In your opinion, where are they most effectively invested? So at the ports of entry, there are two things. It's non-intrusive inspection technology, which includes the x-rays so we can get more vehicles through them. Uh, these are deep concealments that challenge our officers, more canines. I'm running out of time, and so more let me CUP ask you, officers. compared to that border, it's not one, it's a whole border, where is that money most effectively invested to interdict drug shipments? For hard narcotics, it's non-intrusive inspection technology. That's the most important. Madam Chair, I'm out of time.
Uh, gentleman yells back. The chair now recognizes Ms. Demings uh, from Florida for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, and to the ranking member uh, as well. Commissioner, it's good to see you. Congratulations on your uh, confirmation. Um, since 2009, uh, the Orlando International Airport has seen its international passenger arrivals increase by 89 percent, yet the number of Custom and Border Patrol officers have stayed relatively flat. Um, as a former law enforcement officer, I was assigned out at OIA for a good number of years, and so I know the critical role that your um, agency serves. The airport authority has invested millions of dollars in automatic passport, control kiosks, and other uh, technology. Um, but in 2007, Customs and Border Patrol officers serving at Orlando International Airport were notified that some of the um, officers would be uh, redeployed for about 90 days to the southwest border crossings. Uh, these temporary assignments would definitely, uh, would continue indefinitely. At the time, CPB official um, also made statements that, or officials also made statements that these assignments are beneficial to both the temporary duty locations as well as to the um, their permanently assigned place because they'd gain broader um, experience. Could you please tell me how does CBP determine which ports of entry will temporarily deploy officers to the southwest border? And more broadly, how are you prioritizing personnel and resources for the ports of entry? I understand the, I guess I would say, marching orders to, um, to the border, but we're also extremely concerned about our ports of entry as well. Sure. Thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, we have a tremendous relationship with Orlando uh, International Airport. Um, recently, we've been uh, pi piloting facial recognition technology with Orlando, and they are so impressed by the effectiveness that they're looking at expanding that partnership with us. And you're absolutely right, they've invested through a similar uh, program to the, the uh, donation acceptance program that we were talking about earlier by partnering with us to facilitate that travel. So that 89% growth uh, in 2013 and 2014, we were actually able to reduce wait times uh, and we've been able to stay on top of that through that partnership and through applying enhanced technology, increased global entry membership, and, and I think facial recognition is going to take us to the next level on facilitating those entries. I'm also glad you asked about staffing at ports of entry more broadly. Yeah, how but do you prioritize I, I think this which is, ports you're going to take from sure. to deploy somewhere else? Because that certainly concerns me. Uh, understood. And, and just, I guess, the first point is our southwest border ports of entry, some of the biggest, uh, San Ysidro, as Representative Correa mentioned, uh, as well as Calexico, mm -hmm. Nogales, uh, Laredo, it, these, these are some of the toughest places we have in terms of staffing, and the traffic at the land border is relentless, and, and that's, that panoply of threats that we face at, at that border uh, provides a tremendous experience for our officers. So we try to pull in a balanced way. Uh, from ports of entry when we do these temporary TDYs to augment our abilities at the southern border ports of entry. Uh, so or Orlando was probably asked for staff at the same time that, that ports along the eastern seaboard in the Midwest, uh, even the West Coast uh, for seaports and airports were asked to support uh, those TDYs. And, and so that, that's, a, that's a rolling basis. It, it's based on who is closest to their capacity for staffing uh, and who needs help the most. Uh, and so that will continue to be a feature as we increase our hiring. That said, we, we have hired 850 officers in the last three years. We made we hired 200 and net 200 last year, mm -hmm. and we are expecting significant progress this year thanks to the funding for 328 additional officers. That continues to be a hiring priority for us. I think it's maybe misunderstood that we're not asking for officers. We actually are. Uh, we're sending a, a workload staffing model to Congress uh, every year. Let me ask you about that, yes. particularly about attrition. Um, you know, I agree that you, having worked along with your officers and agents that they are fine men and women who do a great job. Uh, but what are you doing to uh, deal with attrition? What steps are you taking to hold on to your current staff? I don't know what's going on with the attrition rate because it is high. And what are you doing to attract additional um, persons into the profession? So first and foremost, we're, we're, the, the hiring is going to be the best way to hold on to our current staff as well because it's going to balance that workload out. There was a reference to the overtime hours, to double shifts. We want to uh, limit that as much as we can. So that, that's one key piece. Two, we are clarifying our career paths and offering mobility 
predictable mobility for our officers and agents. One of the number one reasons we see people leaving uh, CBP is that they feel like they can't move to other locations. Uh, maybe they've taken a job on the border, uh, and they've, they've been excited by the opportunity to serve, but then they'd like to move back to a major metropolitan area or go back home, and they haven't had the mobility within our system to do that. We now have a web-enabled, predictable process where we are supporting moves thanks to Congress. Uh, this year we're going to have almost 1,200 moves for frontline personnel between our officers and agents uh, through multiple uh, opportunities. So we think that mobility is going to be key. And then we're investing in workforce resilience. Uh, we've created a national resiliency task force where we're trying to look at the whole person uh, and not just uh, you know, the individual but their family. And we're trying to address suicide prevention. We're trying to address issues with stress and provide that support and that environment uh, that, that shows our professionals that we care about them and, and we care about their career progression. Thank you, Commissioner. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Ms. Barragan from California for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and our ranking member. Um, Commissioner, thank you for uh, being here today. Um, I want to um, follow up a little on the co um, questions in my, by my colleague, uh, Mr. Correa from California. Um, I also um, have concerns about staffing levels at the ports of entry. Um, I happen to represent uh, the Port of Los Angeles, um, and it's, a, as you know, a very busy port. Uh, we call it America's Port. I want to start by thanking you um, and CBP for the terrific personnel that is down there um, and the partnership with the Port of Los Angeles. Um, and so. I think the use of the ACE uh, program has been very helpful, the Automated Commercial um, Environment Program, uh, to help uh, efficiency and the supply chain there. Um, but I, I remain concerned about the adequate staffing um, at major uh, points of entry, uh, especially in our seaports and our airports, um, where I happen to believe um, is the larger target of a terror threat. Um, and I know you alluded to this a little bit, but how do you decide um, when you're balancing CBP officers um, between something like the seaports, the airport, and then the border wall, the, or the southwest border? Sure. So I mentioned the workload staffing model. This is where we submit to Congress every year based on a number of workload factors and threat vectors, how many personnel we need in each area of our operations. It's actually granular down to the specific port of entry. Uh, so we, we've requested another 2,500 officers uh, nationwide on a prioritized basis, and we've provided recommended fee proposals for Congress to consider that would allow us to hire that staffing. And the Port of LA is included. Um, we do appreciate, by the way, I had the leadership of the Port of LA uh, visit, uh, I think about a month ago, a uh, tremendous partnership there, uh, and, and that com communication and dialogue is, is, I think, critical. The other way we, we try to balance that staffing is recognizing the impact of our innovation. You mentioned the automated commercial environment, single window, which is providing significant capability. But we've also done several things to, to help make us more efficient. Our, our radiation portal monitors, which we have at every exit to the terminal at the Port of LA, uh, those are now more finely tuned so that they detect threats, but they don't trigger on so many naturally occurring materials that, that are backing up trucks. Right. You They're mentioned um, the 2,500 additional officers. Um, is that from, uh, I think I saw a most recent CBP Office of Field Workload Staffing Model. Is that where that comes from? Correct. And um, I have, I have uh, been reading and looking, and I have seen the administration put requests in for more uh, border agents, but I haven't uh, seen a request, um, rather I haven't seen a, a request from the administration for any of those 2,500 additional CBP officers that you identify are needed. Um, have you heard back on whether uh, that's going to be coming down the pipeline anytime soon on this administration making that a priority? It was actually in the President's 18 budget as a fee request, and we sent that legislative proposal forward the last four consecutive years uh, to Congress. Uh, so so it, there was a formal request for uh, officers against that requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's also my understanding that there's um, a shortage of frontline CBP officers um, at the LA Long Beach Port Complex, and that's also uh, concerning to me. Is CBP forecasting increased staffing at the seaports uh, down in Los Angeles and Long Beach? 
So it's an important point. We, we have to not only work on the land border ports of entry, with, which have that present crush of traffic every day, but we have to support our seaports uh, as well. And so I, in that 2,500 that we've requested, a significant number would go to seaports, including uh, the port of LA Long Beach. So do you have a forecast at all on increasing staffing down at those two ports? Do you have any idea? Like are we talking about six months, a year? Do you have any idea? Well, it's, it's dependent on, on increased funding for us to hire new staff. Uh, if the workload uh, balance changes in a way that LA Long Beach Seaport needs staff more than, than another port of entry, then we rebalance within that year and are able to, to reassign through that mobility program that I referenced. Got it. Thank you. Um, I have heard from the Pacific Merchant Shipping Association, the PMSA, about a new policy to charge terminals for scanning operations outside of normal hours, which go from 8 a.m. to 3, um, outside the hours of 8 a.m. To, to 3 a.m. Many of the terminals work outside of those hours, either to build trains or have trucks lined up by 7 a.m. so they're ready to leave once 8 a.m. hits. Now, they have to pay by the hour for those operations, which is cost, and these costs, as I'm hearing, are becoming unpredictable at times. Um, are you committed at all to working with the PMSA? Will you commit to working with them to see what can be done to reduce some of the impacts um, and the cost? I'd be happy to work on that issue with the PMSA. Great. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. We're going to do another round here. Um, so uh, fully support the deployment of the National Guard to the border. Uh, we've, uh, representing a border community myself, uh, it's just taking too long uh, to get the political will for Washington, D.C. Uh, to be able to meet the president's intent to secure our border. So I fully support it. Can you talk about the status of the deployment, uh, what the National Guard uh, troops are doing, and uh, do, should we see uh, additional uh, National Guardsmen and women deployed as, as well for the mission? CBP, we, it, we very much appreciate the opportunity to work with the Guard again. Uh, as, as noted, we did it in 2006, we did it in 2010, and had ongoing uh, air surveillance support through 2016. So to have them back uh, in, in significant numbers is going to be a huge augmentation to our capabilities. We've got 600 already on the ground with us uh, doing missions like surveillance, uh, operational support, uh, everything from helping us on the radio side to intelligence analysts uh, to the motor pool, uh, and then infrastructure. Now, we've got to maintain all of these roads, these access roads to the border. Uh, they have capable units that are, are dedicated to these areas. So they're going to extend our capability in a number of different areas, uh, uh, to your point, Chairwoman, to, to, to enhance our ability to secure that border as we continue to invest in the resources necessary and the personnel to do so. Great. So how many are deployed right now? 607 as of this morning. And is there any plan to deploy more? There is, of course. Uh, we, we have a set of missions that we've sent uh, through the National Guard Bureau at, at Maine uh, Department of Defense, uh, chopped out to the states. Uh, the adjutants general are then the responding entities uh, under the command of the, the governors under Title 32, including Governor Ducey, who's been very supportive. Uh, and then we're going to be uh, applying those, those assets through our sector command leadership uh, to the the specific missions we need. We're also hoping to have support uh, for our cargo and our counter narcotics missions at ports of entry and for uh, aviation surveillance as well in the coming weeks. Great, thanks. Uh, this, so this frees up the Border Patrol agents to be able to be patrolling the border and intercepting the illegal activity uh, while you have the guardsmen doing many times within their core competencies in the military, right, to provide some of those support functions. Uh, but also concerned about the Border Patrol agents that we have uh, really being focused on the border. Um, we There were some media reports on uh, one station in particular, I think had 700 agents assigned and on any or on one uh, snapshot had only about 12% available out patrolling the border. I always use my military analogies, right? I commanded a fighter squadron, we had a small number of fighter pilots, and then we had other people that were trained in all the other support functions. But if you want us to be doing all the support functions, we probably won't do a good job, number one. Uh, but we're the ones trained to be the fighter pilots. So uh, when you've got Border Patrol agents, highly trained law enforcement officers that are doing things like fleet management and other admin, uh, really other people should be trained to do in other positions. Uh, how do we, how do, you know, what is the issue there? Because 12% is not uh, adequate. We need to make sure that these highly trained agents are out there patrolling the border. And what else can we do to partner with you to free them up to do that job? Well, while well, having uh, less trained people or more specified trained people uh, doing these other support functions, what we call in the military sometimes, some of the admin things and the paperwork. Well, I won't tell you what we call it, but anyway, um, we're on the record here. But uh, you know, it's really an important part of the mission, but you don't want the agents doing all of that because it takes them away from the main mission. 
I could not agree more with you, Chairman, that we want our highly trained professionals out on the border doing their, their core law enforcement work and patrolling. Uh, one of the areas that you, that you highlighted, not just the mission support side, but also processing. Uh, this goes back to the loopholes. Right. The time it takes to, to properly process and care for family units and kids are, is much more extensive than, than other groups. And, and the, the station that you cited uh, is in Rio Grande Valley sector where we see the most uh, crossings of, of this type. Uh, during, during that time, we had about 60% of our agents doing patrol work uh, sector-wide. So it, it, we understand uh, the, the scrutiny. We want to make sure those agents are out on the line. We, we, that's where we need them. Uh, but that processing issue, supporting them by with remote processing, closing the loopholes, and then looking at maybe a more balanced workforce investment. Uh, I know it's, it's very important to invest in our, our uh, very highly trained law enforcement professionals, but we need to support them with a variety of occupations that might, might be able to hire more quickly uh, to, to really free them up to do their work. Uh, as you noted, we're going we're gonna to realize a number of agents back to the border from having the National Guard support mm -hmm. us in, in operational and mission support functions. I think we can do the same on a sustained basis with a, with a more balanced staffing profile. Because you don't need to be an agent to do the processing, right? That could be a GS-7 who's doing that, who's trained specifically for that, or do you have to be an agent? For, that's an immigration officer function. Okay. Uh, so, uh, But we are doing things like remote uh, processing for stations that are not as busy in other sectors. Uh, they're, they're doing the interviews and processing via VTC, via Skype, if you will. Uh, that, that's been helpful because we're trying to alleviate those high traffic sectors so they can get out on the border doing their mission. Okay, thanks. I'm out of time. So gen uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Baylor. Uh, are we using Department of Defense dollars or Department of Homeland Security dollars to pay for uh, the National Guard deployment? The, the National Guard deployment is funded by the Department of Defense. Okay. Uh, the, um, with respect to the issue of hiring. Um, I, I mentioned this to Chief Fatello, I think. You know, we, we, we passed that polygraph bill out of the House, um, but even then, even if we were able to get that through the Senate and signed by the President, uh, you know, given the shortfall, uh, and I, I appreciate the numbers you were throwing out with respect to 800 hires over three years, and, uh, but even then, that's, that's still really well short of the goals, and I'm not really suggesting it's anybody's fault, but it just seems to me that we need to take a, a really new look at the way we're uh, addressing that, right? And, and uh, what I have, um, and, and ever since I brought this up with Chief Fatello, uh, back home, I uh, talked to one of our sheriff's officers, sheriff's um, just last week, uh, it seems to me that one of the things we might want to really take a look at is, um, you know, focusing on hiring people that are closer to the location wherever they're going to be sent, because what what I'm hearing from uh, law enforcement personnel on the ground, not necessarily who are in border patrol, but who handle, um, you know, who who, are, who supervise municipal police and sheriff's deputies, is that one of the things is, you know, if you live uh, if you live in the city of if you live in the Rio Grande Valley, which is Brownsville and McAllen, and uh, you're not sure that you're going to be able to be stationed within a 30 to 45 mile radius of where you live. Uh, you know, even being stationed at the checkpoint in Kingsville, for example, which doesn't sound like that far, but if that means you're going to commute an hour and a half back and forth each day or move your family uh, to Kingsville, uh, that appears to be one of the uh, major challenges I think we're confronting, uh, at least from what I'm hearing on the ground. So that, that's an important policy that we have for our Border Patrol agents uh, for their initial duty station uh, to not be right there at home. Uh, we want to make sure that, that that's an in integrity and anti-corruption measure to ensure that they're not uh, in a cycle with neighbors uh, who might be involved in cross-border uh, criminal activity uh, and, and be susceptible to that. So we want to start them off in the agency uh, in, in, a, in a location that's a little bit further away. But there is a mobility factor later in the career, and that's something that we're trying to emphasize. Uh, but, but to your point, taking a fresh look at every aspect of our hiring cycle is, is my top mission support priority. It was my first statement in, in, in what my vision is for CBP. Uh, and even though we've made 40 separate process improvements, we've reduced the time to hire, we've partnered with DOD on veteran hiring, 
Uh, all of that is, is helping, but it's not enough. Uh, we, we need to do more, and that includes accessing the expertise of the private sector, doing digital uh, recruiting and marketing in a more precise and targeted way, uh, increasing our, our capacity at different choke points in the hiring cycle, and then, to your point, effective administration of the polygraph, and ideally, a limited waiver for those that we can trust based on their military and law enforcement service and other capacities. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it sounds to me like we probably ought to take a fresh look at that original policy you mentioned because um, it seems, it just seems from what I'm hearing is, is, is that appear, every time I ask people that, you know, are on the ground, uh, that appears to be uh, the major challenge. And uh, I, I think we ought to have a little bit more faith, uh, you know, in, our, in, in the system that we set up and in the agents, um, you know, that we hire. Uh, because I think if we're able to, uh, I think our, our best chance at being able to fulfill that shortage is going to be to address the location issue. So, you know, maybe that's something we can work on uh, further. I also, um, and we can talk about this when we're done, but uh, I, I, I re submitted a letter, I think, res requesting details on plans and, uh, you know, for what, when, and where with respect to the border wall. And I don't know if you've had a chance to respond to that in writing or when we might be able to uh, get that. I have a signed copy to deliver to you in our okay. meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Chair and organize Mr. Correa, California, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, just uh, there was a lot of discussion in this committee and other places that the polygraph test was being a major issue in terms of your hiring um, uh, goals. It, it, what's the latest on that issue? So we've been working to, to streamline our administration of the polygraph and also to ensure that we have the right polygraph protocol for a pre-employment test at an agency of our size and scope. Uh, so over the last 10 months, we've been piloting an alternative federally certified protocol uh, for our, our pre-employment polygraph, and it's showing very good results. It's reduced uh, the time of the exam. Uh, it's, it's maintained the disqualification numbers that we had before, so we're, we're still identifying those people that haven't disclosed something in their background that would be disqualifying because we have very stringent uh, background standards. Uh, but we're, we're not seeing a physiological response in as many cases that, that creates an inconclusive. Uh, so our pass rates uh, have, have increased using this protocol. And we're in the process of, of completing our pilot analysis and certifying it and looking at it as uh, something we're going to use going forward. So we, we've really uh, tried to improve our polygraph administration on multiple levels. Thank you. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, talking about uh, national defense, terrorism, um, um, Folks that have been where you're at right now have stated that uh, if any terrorists or drugs reach our borders, we've essentially lost the war. So what we've got to do is really interdict the terrorists, bad folks, as far as we can for our border, as well as, as uh, drugs. Um, any thoughts, any comments on the progress or what we need to do to help you with your cooperation with other countries, other agencies, other attorney generals around the world uh, that may help us identify those bad folks uh, before they get here. Thank you for that comment, Congressman. I could not agree more with you that, that addressing the threats as early as possible in a, in a travel cycle uh, toward the United States is the best way to secure our border, and, and we're doing that through our National Targeting Center. Uh, last year, uh, over 2,800 uh, individuals uh, who turned out to be known or suspected terrorists were prevented from even getting permission to travel to the U.S. through a visa, through an electronic system for travel authorization. Another 900 in the air environment were denied uh, boarding before uh, they could fly to the U.S. Uh, uh, working with our allies around the world through preclearance programs to, so that we can clear uh, travelers headed to the U.S. before they even board a flight uh, is another method that's critical, and really just building the capacity of our international partners. We've had two U.N. Security Council resolutions that highlight the importance of, of collecting data, from analyzing it, from sharing watch list information, and from partnering across borders so that we can protect this global travel cycle uh, has been a very positive development, and CBP has been spearheading efforts to help allies around the world in, in the Western Hemisphere in Europe in Asia to develop and, and utilize this capability because we think it's critical uh, to, to our security going forward. So Congress's support uh, to those programs which were uh, authorized uh, in our in, in the tra uh, Trade Facilitation Trade Enforcement Act of 2015 has been very helpful and we intend to continue those advances. Anything else we can do to help you build those relationships overseas? Uh, on the relationships overseas, I, I think the 
we, we need to tackle this challenge uh, on being able to protect privacy uh, between and the sharing of data between countries uh, while still addressing the threats. And, and we think with advanced technology, the ability to check data in an anonymized way and only see and share the hits, that we have a, a process to do that. So being able to invest and demonstrate that technology capability will enhance our sharing. So you do have some uh, protocol for sharing uh, certain uh, information with uh, foreign governments that may be of interest, mutual interest to all involved, so to speak, for national security purposes. We absolutely do, both at CBP and with our partners in the federal law enforcement and intelligence community. Would those consider Mexico, Colombia, some of those other Latin American countries? Uh, absolutely. Uh, our partnership with Mexico is, is about as active as any uh, global uh, partnership in, in the world, including uh, sharing information on trade violations, on potential security threats, on immigration issues. Uh, we're, I, I just signed three agreements in Mexico City uh, last month on trade co enforcement collaboration and information sharing. Uh, it's, a, it's a critical partnership. I'd love to get more information on those uh, agreements. Thank you very much, sir, for again, to your service and to your personnel for the good job they do. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield. I'm Neil's back. I have a few more questions. Right. Uh, the first is on uh, land ports of entry. Uh, these are so critical for both uh, economic opportunity and increasing cross-border commerce, which is going to provide economic development and jobs in America, but also for security. Uh, the potential for um, uh, additional hard drugs, uh, we've seen the, the vast majority of the drugs are coming through the ports of entry, as you mentioned, uh, plus other contraband and things that could make it through the ports of entry. So this is the, th these ports of entries are, they're a part of border security, but they're also a part of economic development and opportunity. And they are, uh, many of them are woefully inadequate, like the Douglas port of entry in my district, uh, built in 1933. Uh, this needs to be replaced, and we've been advocating for it since I've been here. Glad to see that it is, uh, there's a feasibility study going on now, uh, and there is an opportunity for it to be funded in the future. Uh, have you been to the Douglas Port of Entry, and can you talk about the importance to upgrade ports of entry like this, both for economic opportunity and for security and counterterrorism mission? Absolutely. I have been to the Douglas Port of Entry multiple times, a challenging uh, facility, uh, to say the least, especially given the growth in traffic since the 1930s. Yes. Uh, the change in our mission, the change in our agency composition, uh, it wasn't designed for where we are today. Uh, so the, the imperative to invest both in the physical infrastructure to, to accommodate the flow, but also the security technology, uh, the, the, the offices, the, the detention areas, uh, all of that is critical uh, so we can facilitate that cross-border uh, trade and travel. So we have uh, uh, initiated a feasibility study on the Port of Douglas uh, that's going to tell us both the, the planning factors for additional cargo flow as well as, as the regular travel. Uh, we're going to need to then uh, put a budget wedge against that uh, study to, to see if we can modernize uh, the, the port itself, and, and we have uh, in that in our, in our planning, but also in what's the right uh, structure for the future of the port. Uh, and that's that's a, a, an area that we need to invest in across the board on, on the border, as well as in partnership with Mexico and Canada. Because if we don't align our, our investments and our priorities, uh, we can create uh, real challenges. I agree. Where, can you tell me where the Douglas port fits in your priorities right now on the list? It, it, the modernization of the Douglas Port of Entry is a, is a top 10 priority that we have uh, budgeted in, in the out years. Okay, top 10, but I mean, we just don't usually only get zero to two, it seems, over the last few years. So it, it was in the five-year plan. Uh, top 10 doesn't sound as uh, high as I would like it to be. I, I believe it's in 19 or 20. I'll get back to you, Chairwoman, okay. on, on exactly In FY19 or FY20, yes. you mean, is, is working through. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the other element uh, that's been talked about already is um, the, f the opioid crisis, uh, fentanyl specifically, coming through the ports of entry. Do you have the adequate uh, technology to detect it? It can be deadly to our agents as well and the training that they need in order to uh, identify and be able to respond quickly should they be exposed to it? So uh, middle of last year, I commissioned a counter-opioid strategy at CBP, and it, and it is attacking everything from the advanced data, for instance, in the international mail environment, uh, to the technology we need to detect small vials of, of fentanyl, which is extraordinarily potent, as you referenced, the ability to test it, not only for the safety of our officers and, and ag specialists and canines, 
but also give us the quick reaction so that we can do with an investigative partner a controlled delivery and address the network that's bringing that into the country and not just make that individual seizure. Uh, so we, we have benefited from support from Congress to invest in testing technology both in 17 and now in 18. Uh, we're getting that out to all of the key ports of entry that need it, and we're also buying uh, naloxone uh, so that is, if there's an accidental exposure uh, that creates a health hazard for our personnel, that they have naloxone on site uh, to address that quickly, uh, and it works also for our, our canines as well. You said you're buying naloxone. Is it not available right now at, the, at all ports of entry? It's available at all ports of entry, but we want to deploy more, so it's, it's more readily accessible okay. uh, because of how quickly and how potent this, this drug uh, acts. Great, thank you. All right, Mr. Correa, do you have any more questions? Okay. Um, I want to thank our witness uh, for your valuable uh, testimony and uh, members for the questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witness. I'd ask you to respond to those in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7E, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. And without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.